<laughs> enough. I deserve it, but enough. Anyway, good evening and welcome to the Magic Show. And welcome to you at home, people watching at home there. Welcome. And uh, it's a good show tonight. You're in for a real treat. Some great guests and some good magic. Um, like this, for example. Now, this is a good trick. You'll like this. Not a lot, but you'll like it. And it's, uh, I'll explain everything about it, because you will probably find this totally unbelievable. Here is a tube. Now, this is tube number one. You can see all the way through it, OK? If I hold my hand there, you can see my hand goes all the way through it. And it's what they call a thin wall tube in the trade. Over here, we have tube number two. Tube number two is the same as tube number one, except that it is a bit bigger, so the tube number one can fit inside tube number two. So now we've got two tubes, and they're both like this. <laughs> it's not easy. <laughs> now, now, what I want the audience to do now is I can produce from here any colour, head square, you name. Just shout out any colours at all. Shout out colours. Blue. 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 blue, certainly, sir. A blue, blue one. Right, all you've got to do is just reach in here and just reach in here. And, and there it is. I can't, I can't. Come on. A blue, a blue square. <laughs> Sounds like pity. Now, let's get something straight. You could have named any colour. The tubes are empty. You can see right round them and through them. Thin wall tubes, and this one fits inside that one, just like this one fits over that one, like that. Good, innit? And then you reach inside, and here's all the other colours you asked for. Tube number one is fits inside tube number two, and tube number two fits inside tube number one. And you reach... Look. <laughs> what we want is woofing applause here. We don't want you... you know, I mean, I'm not producing little ones like other conjurers do. <laughs> I mean, that's what they do, don't they? Like this, eh? <laughs> no, I'm producing one. It's a big one. Huh? Good grief. clap and the tubes are empty and, and this one's as empty. The thing that baffles me is where does that come from? <laughs> no, no, no. No, 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 not that. This, the rice that's inside. Let's go. <laughs> We've got to get on with the show. I've got some great guests for you. <laughs> <laughs> great guests. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, it won't go back. It came out of that one, so you would have thought it would have come out of that one. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we've been uh, out and about, as they say, or out and about this summer, because we thought it might be a nice idea in the show if we showed you some magic done out of doors. And we went out of doors to do it. So see if you can guess where we went this week. <laughs> Well, 
as you can see, I'm out for a drive in the country in a beautiful car. And uh, I'm actually in someone's driveway. I've got a beautiful lady with me, too. And this is Hilary Kay, a director of Sotheby's. Because at the end of here, we're going to try to find a very rare, unusual, and expensive object. Well, the drive in the country has brought me to Longleat, not only the home of the safari park, but also the home of many beautiful treasures. And we're going to ask the Marquis of Bath if he'll let me borrow one of them. Which is why, of course, I brought you, I lovely can't lady. Wait to see now, them. if you hop out of there, and that will let me get this out. And this is a device. Well, even you don't know what this is for yet. Is that our tea? No, this isn't a luncheon <laughs> box. This is something very special. You'll like this. Not a lot, but you'll like it. Now, if you just... We'll put that there, and we'll just try and see if there's anyone in. Ah, oh, your lordship. Oh, nice to see you. How I'm nice to see you come. again. Yes. Really this am. is Hilary Kay, who comes from Hello, Sotheby's. Oh, nice to Hello. meet you. Hello. Hello. Very glad you... I know. Of course, the nice weather, too. And a lovely lady in nice weather. It's yeah, even lovely more lady. important, sir. <laughs> now, I, I must explain to the viewers exactly why I'm here. And I'm here because this house has a lot of treasures, and we'd like to borrow one. Certainly, of course. You, you're very generous. Yeah. But, but, but can I have one about this big? You see, I'm... Oh, we've got heaps of them. Yes, we can find one like that. Can I'm you? sure I can, Well, yeah. what I'd like you to do, sir, is you go in there and choose an object about that big. I'd like it to be about that big. And, yeah. um, and if I could leave my hat, coat and gloves with your man, that would be Mr. very Crab, nice. Mr. Crab, certainly. Mr. Crab, thank you. you. Would you take those, Mr. Crab? And uh, if you would go and pick us an object, sir, the hat, sir. Thank the, you. Then I'll come out with you, Kate. Uh, yeah, round the side, if you wouldn't mind, round sir. Round the side, right you up. Thank I'll you very much. We'll meet you very around the corner. Right you be, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Crab. Well, Hilary, it's you, me, and the box on the side lawn. Very well. Welcome to the House of Cards. The card castle that stands behind me is ginormous. And, of course, I'm dressed in this outfit to, because I'm representing one of the playing cards. And in this segment, we always do playing cards. Might I point out I'm not the king of any particular suit. And I hasten to add, I'm also not the queen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm supposed to be the jack of something or other, but I haven't figured it out which yet. Anyway, because I'm a magician, strange people come and talk to me. And the other day, a fellow came up to me and he says, Paul, do you buy playing cards? I thought, what a stupid question. I says, yes, of course I do. He says, well, when you buy them, occasionally in the pack, do you ever get a blank one? I said, yeah, of course I do, get blank cards. He said, have you, have you kept them? I said, yes. And I took out 52, 53 blank pieces of playing card. And I showed them to him. He says, now, the idea I've had is this. I could save you a fortune. Supposing you bought all your playing cards blank. I said, what good would that be? He says, well, you see, if they were blank, they've got to be cheaper, haven't they? I said, yeah, of course they are. And he says, and if they were blank both sides, cheaper still, because you wouldn't have to pay for the backs to be on there, would you? I says, no, you're right. Well, he says, there you go then, just buy blank playing cards and with my new brilliant thought wave process, you would be able to just, pow, think of a card and it would be printed on there. I said, how do you figure that out? He said, well, for example, think of a playing card, any one at all, and I'll cut the card. So I thought, okay, a four of clubs. And he went, <whistles> and he cut the cards and he had got <laughs> the four of clubs printed. I said, that's amazing, but it's got no back on. He says, I know. I said, well, that's no good to me. He says, well, all right then, think of a different card. I said, can I think of a red card? He said, yes. And I thought of the nine of hearts. He went, <whistles> and he cut the cards, and he got one. And I said, it, it's got no back on. And he said, I know. <laughs> I said, well, look, I said, can you cut the cards anyway? He said, yeah, you just cut them, you cut them if you want. So I took all the cards, and I thought, seven of diamonds, cut the cards, and I got one. I thought, uh, two of hearts, and I got one. I kept thinking of cards, but they'd always got no back on. And every time I mentioned it, he said, I know. <laughs> I said, well, how do you get the back on a playing card? He says, it's very simple. You take one of the blank playing cards and you think of the back. You see, that's your problem. You've only been thinking of the front. I said, oh. So I thought of a blue back back, all over geometric type design, and he went, <whistles> and I had one. <laughs> now, I 
didn't understand this, so I said to him, now look, I said, what's the use of a pack of cards? It's only got a front and it's only one card and a back at the other end and all the cards in the middle are all blank. He says, no good at all. What you have to do is get the whole of the audience to think of a different card each. So, audience, think of a playing card, okay? Now, have you all thought of one? Say, yes, Paul. Yes, yes Paul. They've thought of one, you see? And there they were with all the cards printed back and front, like that, just by thought waves. And he didn't even go... <laughs> it was just there. I said, this is amazing. How much is that idea? He said, £56,000. Well, I've got to tell you, my mind went blank. <laughs> And the moment my mind went blank, so did all the playing cards, backwards and forwards. I said, I can't afford £56,000. He says, you don't have to afford £56,000. If you don't want to spend the money, Mr Daniels, I'll keep my ideas all there. <laughs> and he did, and he walked away and left me with 52, 53 blank pieces of playing card and, of course, my £56,000. <laughs> My next guests tonight, ladies and gentlemen, uh, combine great skill and great beauty of movement in a balancing act, basically, but it's so different. I want you to watch closely. From Havana, Cuba, we bring you Doris and Mario.
that good? Nice, that. Now then, funny thing happened to me the other day. I was walking down the street, minding my own business, which is very rare for me, and, um, <laughs> and I saw this fella, and he was putting a sign up on a shop. Now, do you read the signs on shops? I mean, do you really? I mean, you give them a glance. But do you really read them and see how stupid they are? This fellow was putting one up. I've got a copy of it here. Look. Fresh fish sold here today. <laughs> now, you wouldn't give that a second glance. Well, I did, and I said to the man sticking it up, excuse me, Bill, because that was his name, Bill Poster. I said, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't his real name. His real name was William Poster, but I knew him. And I said, that's a silly sign. And he says, why is it silly? I said, because if you'd sold the fish yesterday, you wouldn't have any left for today. And if you were selling it, you, nobody sort of advertised, I'm selling fish tomorrow. Today, that's the word. Wrong. And he thought about it, and he says, you're right, you know. So I'll tell you what he did. He got rid of the word today. Good, eh? And he says, now that, fresh fish sold here. I said, well, you wouldn't be selling it anywhere else, would you? <laughs> <laughs> he says, what do you mean? I says, well, if you put the sign up here, I mean, you wouldn't be selling it anywhere else. He says, oh, I understand. He says, it's not necessary for me to stick that up either, is it? And I says, no, fresh fish sold, he says. I says, do you own this shop? He says, no. I says, who does? He says, the fellow told me to stick this up. <laughs> I says, well, he doesn't give the stuff away, does he? Oh, he says, of course he doesn't. I says, there you go. It's unnecessary to inform the public you're selling the stuff. <coughs> Shops do not give it away. He says, right, I'll stick out a fresh fish. I says, that's a silly sign. <laughs> he says, why? I've got to stick something up. I says, well, he wouldn't be selling old, tatty, stale, smelly old fish, would he? I mean, rotten. <laughs> He says, no, I see what you mean. So he says, we don't need that. He says, all I need to stick up is that bit, fish. I says, yes, that's all, just the word fish. I says, the rest is superfluous. And then I had to think, and I says, just a minute. He was just about to stick it up. <laughs> <laughs> it's not necessary. He says, I've got to stick fish up. I says, sniff. So he went, poo, fish. I said, see? <laughs> you don't need to advertise that at all. So we were just bundling it all up to get rid of it. When out of the door of the shop came this fella. Well, you should have seen this fella. Was he ever a size? I mean, a big fella. And he said, excuse me, where's the sign for my shop? So I thought fast, and I am a magician. So what I did was I give a little blow. Oh, 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 and he had back together fresh fish sold here today. <laughs> Well, you might expect it in this show, outside a fish shop, it's just a red herring. <laughs>
Jim has brought several members over of the uh, Californian Academy, and normally they incorporate all their skills into a little playlet, as I've said. We've only time for the highlights, and I'll explain exactly what happens as it, you see it happening. <laughs> What has already happened in the story is that a young boy played by Dan Mather, Jim Mather's son, is having a dream because he's been oh. mugged earlier in the day and now he dreams he has befriended two martial arts masters and in fact becomes one himself. In the dream, Dan Mather, the young boy, becomes a master of nunchaku and he shows off a little with it in front of his two new friends. The nasty guy reappears <laughs> and fires an arrow. And the real master of nunchaku smashes it to pieces. An incredible feat considering the speed of the arrow. Another one of the masters of this art, Gary Nakahama, himself a karate champion, <laughs> now demonstrates the bow staff. Very similar, of course, to the device used by Robin Hood and his merry men in days of yore. And if you watch the end of the stick, you'll realize with the speed you could get a very nasty crack on the head, or when he lunges forward, somewhat of a stomachache. <laughs> Gary Nakahama. And you've already seen Jim Mather split one of these in half using a device known as nunchaku. But the thing that made him world famous was the fact he can catch these as they fly through the air with his bare hand. Watch closely. Take it to learn that. <laughs> I've been doing it for about uh, 20 years. 20 years? Wow. You see, the thing that gets me is you've got to time exactly when to close your hand, mm -hmm. and this thing is traveling fast. You don't have a long time, do you? No. You're very reliant on the archer. Right. <laughs> that helps. Kurt Eppel. Right. Kurt yeah. Eppel. Nice guy as well. Yeah. And of course, I must warn. You know, I admire the talent, but I must warn all the children here and the children who are watching at home, and anybody in fact, do not. Do not try this trick. And even uh, the master wears these safety goggles devices. Because right. you got hit once, didn't you? Yes. Yeah. In uh, the left eye. In the left eye. And don't think you can <coughs> also try it, Jim, no. with the rubber sucker type. That's right. The surgeon warned you against that, didn't he? That's right. He said that the, there's more eyes lost through blunt objects going in than sharp ones. So it's a strong sure. warning. Now, we're going to ask you to do, well, me a favor and the <laughs> show a favor. Can I just have this over here, Debbie? I see they call your assistant Debbie also, <laughs> yeah? Now, Debbie has brought this. All the great acts have assistants called Debbie. <laughs> I see. And, and, and this for me. Thank you very much. And um, I should have. What, what is this? Uh, this is a uh, compound bow. And... Uh, it's got pulleys fitted. Right. What, what they're for? Uh, it's a uh, pulley system that uh, essentially allows a bow of a much shorter size to achieve the same amount of power as, say, a... a a six foot long bow would. I see. So compared with the last one, all this pulley system is pushing it out about three times as fast. Yes, much quicker. I noticed at rehearsal we could actually hear them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah I can hear them. I can hear them coming. You can hear them coming. Well, that helps, I suppose. Right. And uh, we're going to ask your bowman to, um, to shoot this arrow, which has got, got a tip on it. And I'll explain that as he did. Kurt, would you come in? Ladies and gentlemen, Kurt Apple, the bowman. Good night, round Thank you. What we've done is, you see, we've set up um, a couple of doors, and these are the sort of doors you'd find in English houses, and Kurt is going to uh, show us not so much the, how sharp the arrow is, but the speed of the, the bow and the power of that bow. Right through one door <laughs> and into the next, I think, from here. And, uh, and that's pretty powerful, isn't it? And you've got to remember 
ladies and gentlemen, that these things are not designed to go through wood, they're just designed to go through animal matter. Some of it human. <laughs> so uh, at least we've re you've removed the points. But even so, these things can be dangerous. Yes. And how fast do they go, you know, off the long ball we saw before? Well, at this distance, I would uh, estimate uh, that it's traveling approximately 100 miles an hour. And that ball that we're about to see gives about three times that power, but of course, because of the weight, the speed will be reduced to about, what, 170? Uh, somewhere in that range, I would imagine. Mm, she, that's not, at 100, so that's not very far, is it, to go past and grab it. I wish you luck, and thank you for trying on the show. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Jim mm. Maiden. Don't try it, Jim. <laughs> That's just amazing. I don't know what speed that was going, but from where I was sitting over there, that was fast. Ladies and gentlemen, Jim Maiden. to go back to Longley, where things took a little bit longer than we expected them to, so we had to speed up part of it. In other words, do not adjust your set. Well, now, what we've done is come round to the side of the house, and I'll just put this on there, because it's a scientific instrument, and it's, oh, it's also very heavy. Now, Hilary, you are mm. here to value the object, and uh, coming across the lawn now, even as we speak, is the Marcus with the object. And, um, oh, that looks lovely. Yes. Already at this distance, you're valuing it, are you? <laughs> <laughs> That's my job. Thank you. Well... That's suitable? Yes, that looks wonderfully suitable. Um, it's obviously... I, I shall do my antique roadshow bit. It's a, a drinking device <laughs> to stop you drinking because it's got a lid on which traps your nose. Anyway, <laughs> uh, you tell me what it is exactly and... Well, it's a, a covered tankard. It looks as if it's probably Dutch. I would have thought middle part of the, the 18th century, sort of 1750 or so. Does that fit in with your yeah, family that's records? Right. Yeah, that's really right. Lovely object. It's not just German ones, but I think it's Dutch. It's got a little Dutch organ on there as well, hasn't it? Many of them around? I haven't seen that many. I'm, I don't well, know whether there are three, others. We've got three more like that downstairs, but they're bigger. That's really? Big, yeah. Oh, well, well... You wanted a smallish one, didn't you? We shall make this one unique, because it's got a little label on the side, like so, and, um... You're going to have to value it. Just write the value anywhere on that side of the label. Well, I would have thought that in auction this has to be about £3,000 now. What? <laughs> £3,000 to have a drink? <laughs> Terrible. Well, and if you, my lord, wouldn't mind autographing... I don't normally ask for autographs, so there we are. Would no, you please. autograph the other side of the label and then this will make this particular drinking vessel quite unique in the world. There we are. Your dog's actually showing a lot of interest. He's facing the yep. other way. Yeah. They always <laughs> the wrong way. Do they now? Yeah. Well, now what I want you to do, just hang on to that mm -hmm. a second, Hillary, because we're going to now place it into my own device. And if you wouldn't mind, um, I'll just rest that there. It'll probably fall over, knowing me. And we'll just... Do me a favour, sir. Would you just hold that for me? It's a rather heavy box. It holds, in fact, a scientific instrument. Can you just rest that down under your chin? Yes, yeah, say, you're obviously used to this sort of thing. And we'll just take this now and place it inside for safekeeping. About oh, what yeah. year? About 1760. About 1760. And we're going to place this into this little device inside. Now, the actual thing is, you see, this is a scientific device which, which I... I must tell you about. It's, it's just stored in this ancient, venerable case. I bet you're dying to see this, aren't I, you? You're is, in... is it something that I could use on a day-to-day -day basis? Is it going to help me? Not a day-to-day... -day, I couldn't have said it better myself. Now, now, Hillary, just hold that for me, if you wouldn't mind. Right. Thank you. It's a little heavy, but only nothing but the best round here. And let me open this up. 
I find this rather exciting. Uh, you see, Longleat is famous for its scientific equipment. And here we have a piece of scientific equipment uh, par excellence. I bet you've never seen one of these before. This actually, if we can just take this out, ugh, it was designed to fit exactly into its carrying case, like so. And if I can just take that out and put it very carefully onto the tray, I will explain what it's all about. Now, you can see, my lord, it's got several dials mm -hmm. and um, a couple of meters, one of those ancient switches they used in old days to throw the electricity on and off. And we have to set this for, give me a year, 1760. 1760, that goes to one, seven, uh, six, and that's already on zero. Good. Now we just turn that one to there, that one to there, and that one to there. Now, if we just set that a little further forward on the tray so the people at home can see what's going off here, it's a very rare device. Now, to test the age of the object inside, all you have to do is throw the switch. And when you throw the switch like that, I don't know whether it rearranges the molecular structure or whatever of this box. It's quite an old box. Uh, all I know is that I have never actually used it myself. Mm. All, I, all I know is that the thing is supposed to... Oh, my goodness! <laughs> oh, it's a bit... Um, you're quite right to leave go, madam. Um, oh, good grief. Uh, Shall I hold it? Well, no, what it's What else not... is going... Wait a second, where's the tankard? Where's the tankard? Where's the what, sir? Where's the tankard? Ah, well, yes, I did mention it, it restructured the molecular, um... It's gone. <laughs> Um, never mind. Uh, <laughs> one of those things that happens, doesn't it? Um, I want to just put that down. I wonder if you would mind taking this, uh, Mr. Crabbe, so this. Uh, uh, just take that. And if you could bring me a deck of cards, How I shall placate, cards? placate the lordship. Would you like to sit down? Three thousand pounds. Paul. Pardon? Three thousand pounds. <laughs> oh, I know. We'll, we'll. I don't know what we'll do. We'll, we'll have a whip round. Perhaps we can win it back at poker if you're bringing you some cards. Are you in you heard me order the cards. Am I what, sir? In short, for three, uh, that, that amount of money, could you Oh, go no, my lord. We, we do things in a different way, we members of the Magic Circle. Here is a packet of playing cards, all right? And what I'm going to do is take the packet out of its box. Thank you. And we take the packet and we shuffle the cards. Now, this is a very simple overhand shuffle, you see. And if I do this trick really well, Hopefully, it will take just long enough for you to have forgotten you've lost one of the family <laughs> tankards. Shame. Shame, really. Never mind. <laughs> These really are all different. They're just... People suspect I use funny cards, and they're not. These are all different playing cards. And what I would like you to do, my lord, is just have one of them. I shall shuffle the cards, cut the cards, and you just take one of those cards. Top, bottom, middle, anywhere. You've taken two. Oh, you changed your mind. OK. Now... You can see that the rest are all different. Mm -hmm. But subliminally, what is happening to you is you are currently looking at the playing cards and your brain is working like unbelievable speed and you actually now know which one is missing. I do. You do? So, sir, look at your playing card. I don't believe it. You remember it? Name that playing card. The King of Hearts, I know Is it, it the King of Hearts? No, it's not the King of Hearts. It's <laughs> not the King of Hearts. <laughs> 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 Well, all right, then. I, I give up for the moment. What is your playing card? Three of diamonds. The three of diamonds. We'll just show that to the people at home. And if you listen, it's always a funny thing on a, a beautiful summer's day in England. You always hear a little aeroplane droning away in the background. Mm. Well, we haven't got an aeroplane, but you might have been hearing our helicopter droning away in the background. Now then, if you look up there, I shall make your card tumble out of the sky. Look up there. When he gets further I down, you'll see it. The card you chose is the three of diamonds on top of it. Isn't that beautiful? It must feel good when it's not it? It must do. Just me 
meet Lance Sergeant Andy Rule of the Colts Green Guard. Oh, who landed carrying the three of diamonds. I promised you it would yeah. tumble out of the right, sky. Sorry. And we didn't know whether he was going to come down on this side or that side. And we put a little oarsman over there. You'll notice he's also carrying, strapped to his waist, um, a sort of a camera bag device. He's just unbuckling that now. And he's taking that, putting down very, very carefully indeed. Because as he gets out of there, he'll have to open that camera bag on that side. This is our plan B because we hoped he'd come down here and you could take it out, but he'll open it out and show you what's in the bag, we hope. He has to unzip it, and in there he's got oh, a he's bright got a red box. box. take the box from you, sir, and you've had this strapped to you, circling up in the air all the time we've been down here, OK? Right, your berth there. I wonder if you could do me a favour, my lord. Would you just step here, my lovely? Yes. And uh, you come here, my lord, and we just look at that. Isn't that beautifully wrapped? Beautifully. Would you like to just pull the string? Mm -hmm. Remember what happened to the last uh, box? Yeah. Well, I just don't trust you at all. I... I hope it blows up in your face this oh, time. Oh, <laughs> Inside here is, of course, something... Um, there's oh. a, a blue box. I wonder if you could take the take blue box out? out. Yes. Thank you. And if you take that out, we'll just put that down there and let's take the... Would you like to take the lid off the blue box, sir? And inside there, there is uh, <laughs> a, a yellow box. Now, if we take the yellow box out and we... we would you like to take the lid off there? Because really... There'll probably be a matchbox inside. But remember, yeah, the helicopter was circling above us all the time, and yet when Lance Sergeant Rule oh came down, God. he had inside <laughs> here I don't believe a very that. rare item indeed. <laughs> and if we just take that out, That's first of all, it looks like your drinking spine, or whatever the correct name is. It's, um, it's got little cherubs around. One should be playing the organ, there and you. It's still empty, sadly. But um, it's got a value written on by you, three thousand pounds. Yes, that's pounds. my writing. Say yes, Paul. <laughs> yes, Paul. <laughs> and that's yeah, your normal signature. Nice signature. That's your sign. My personal thanks to you, of course, for all your help thank this you afternoon. Very much. And very special routine. thanks, of course, to Lance Sergeant Rule over here. Very thank you. <laughs> I love this. All just in black. And these, of course, <laughs> are for you, courtesy <laughs> of a rather well-known commercial. <laughs> thank you thank very you much. Very much hey, Paul. now that's <laughs> antique magic. <laughs> Next week, Paul Daniels travels to Silverstone Racetrack for a death-defying escape. That's at 8.25, a week tonight.